At a time when Scotland is wrestling with issues of national identity, studying Scotland's history has never been more important. Looking back into Scotland's past and how the nation was formed reveals a Scottish national identity that has evolved and developed over time. It has never been fixed and unchanging. The crucial roles played by William Wallace and Robert the Bruce in the creation of the Scottish state are well known. But the roots of the Scottish nation go further back than this. The Picts of the north and east of Scotland are one of the foundation stones of the Scottish nation. In this film we try to place the Picts in their historical context and show how and why their identity developed and changed. Despite the centuries that separate us, the Picts have left a legacy that continues to influence modern Scotland and fascinate us today. In our two earlier films on the Pictish symbol stones, we saw that Pictish history and culture has been the source of considerable confusion and controversy over the years. If you were to believe some of the more popular sources on Pictish history, Calgacus bursts onto the scene as the first Pict in history. In 87, at the Battle of Mons Graupius, he defends his territory against the invading Roman army. And that battle may have taken place right here on the slopes of Benehi in Aberdeenshire. But the Roman writer Tacitus, who first mentions Calgacus, never refers to him as a Pict. In fact, the term Picti was first coined by the Roman poet Eumenius in 297, more than two centuries after Colgacus is first mentioned. And the people to whom the term Picti was applied by the Romans never used this term to refer to themselves, or even began to think of themselves collectively as Picts, probably until the end of the 7th century, long after the Romans had left Britain for good. Over the years there's been considerable disagreement about the origins of the Picts. The Northumbrian monk Bede, writing in Jarrow in 731, was a contemporary of the Pictish king Onust, or Angus in Gaelic. Bede believed that the, the Picts had their origins somewhere in Scythia, the vast area east of the Black Sea. Since Bede's time, scholars have assigned Scandinavian, Germanic, Celtic and Gallic origins to the Picts. Today, however, historians believe that the Picts are simply the indigenous people of the north and east of Scotland at the time when the Romans were expanding their empire in Britain. But the Picts didn't emerge fully formed, as it were, from the ruins of the Roman Empire in Britain. Between the end of the 4th century, when the Romans left Britain, and the creation of the Scottish Kingdom of Alba at the end of the 9th century, the Picts evolved from perhaps a dozen or so small-scale states into a single political kingdom. By the beginning of the 8th century, the rulers of this kingdom began to identify themselves as King of the Picts. One of the great legacies of the Picts is the large number of standing stones with their unique symbols. From Fife to Orkney, these symbols display a remarkable standardisation. This suggests an underlying political and cultural unity among peoples whose former identities were replaced by a self-conscious Pictish identity. The origin myth of the Picts was written some time after the demise of the Pictish kingdom. It tells of a founding father, Cruthne in Gaelic, who had seven sons. Although the tale is mythical, 
the names may refer to Pictish provinces. Kate appears to refer to Caithness. Fothla is Athol, and K might be a reference to the land of Benehi, a possible location for the Battle of Muns Graupius. Fortree derives from the Roman name for the Verturians. Fortree was located around the inner Murray Firth. Its capital may have been at Burghead. Fortree was later to become the political capital of a united Pictish kingdom. At a local level, Pictish society was initially composed of communities which were linked by lineage. Some historians refer to these kind of societies as farmer republics, decentralised and quite democratic in the way they operated. The communities were small-scale farming and fishing settlements who used timber frame buildings like this model of the roundhouse at the former Archeolink Park. Some Pictish houses like this one would have been built on crannogs for extra security and safety. But as Pictish society became more hierarchical and more centralised, much larger royal residences were built in the fertile lowlands of Aberdeenshire and in Strathnairn. Recent archaeological digs in Rainey have revealed evidence of a large royal residence dating to the 5th and 6th centuries. The buildings were surrounded by a defensive wooden palisade. So when we started excavating here we found that there were a series of enclosures, two very large concentric ditches and outside of that, which you can see just being excavated here in front of me, uh, a palisade slot which is a very large fence, a big wooden plank fence that would have stood proud on the hill here. And all of that was enclosing several buildings, probably hall type buildings, uh, which is quite rare to find in Pictish architecture. Timber built buildings uh, where people were probably living sometimes, feasting and doing other types of activities. Um, in addition to all of the, the amazing kind of architecture that we've got here with ditches and a very, very huge, um, big plank built wall surrounding the site, we also know that they were um, conducting themselves in a very high status way. So they were making bronze jewellery of uh, brooches and moulds. We found the, the moulds, uh, brooches and pins, we found the moulds for those, the crucible for melting metal. Uh, we also have uh, imported pottery from the Mediterranean, which is extremely rare. So we have something called a late Roman amphora, which is probably um, used for either wine or oil. And it originates in uh, Turkey, probably. And this is the currently the most northerly fine spot in the world for that type of pottery, which is very exciting. And that usually only occurs at very, very high status royal sites. Where you know that royal sites down is there any link or connection between the settlement here and the Tap and North? Uh, Iron Age fort. Well, we think there has to be some sort of link because it's so commanding in the landscape and such an impressive and important site. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Picts who were living here knew it was there. They, they must have known and they probably placed their site here uh, purposefully because it was in the shadow of Tapanoth and indeed is connected to several other hill forts in the area. The Picts also developed much stronger and more easily defended forts. Some of these, like Dunotter and Dunakir on the Aberdeenshire coast, were coastal fortifications. Others were hilltop forts. The northeast of Scotland has several examples of these, but two particularly notable examples are at Tapanoth near Rainey and at Mither Tap on Benehi. Although some parts of these were built in pre Pictish times, they were reused and redeveloped by the Picts into the 7th century. Here, just below the summit of Benehi, the entranceway into the Pictish Ford is still clearly visible, as is the defensive rampart wall. The Picts built or rebuilt two huge defensive walls, one at a higher level, and one at a lower level here. A 
At just over 500 meters altitude, even if the climate was vastly different from what it is today, it seems unlikely that this would have been a permanent Pictish residence. The Picts probably came up the hill into the safety of the fort in times of threat and then moved back down the hill when the threat receded. The fort on Tapanoth is another example of an Iron Age fort reused by the Picts. This large fortified central area is even more impressive than the summit of Benehi. The fort here had its own water supply. A recent archaeological investigation has revealed numerous small wooden structures between the upper and lower defensive walls, although the significance of these buildings is yet to be explained. Mither Tap and Tapa North seem to have been abandoned some time in the 7th or 8th century. It's tempting to see this as part of a political process which centralised power within Pictland at Burghead in Fortree and downgraded it or removed it from regional power centres like this. The centralisation of power in the Kingdom of Fortree was one of the key developments in Pictavia during the 7th and 8th centuries. The capital of Fortree is thought to have been the coastal fort of Burghead, with another important fort at Craigfatrick in Inverness. The Burghead bull carvings, which may have had ritual significance, are clear evidence of the high status nature of the settlement. Little evidence of the Pictish fort is visible in Burghead today. The development of the fishing village in the 19th century destroyed much of the evidence. But archaeology and early maps have revealed that a large fort with multiple defensive walls and ditches stood here. It covered an area of seven acres, a very large settlement for the time. Burghead was probably the capital of an increasingly powerful Pictish state, whose fleet maintained contact with religious centres like Port Mahomac on the Tarbet Peninsula, and also with much more distant, dependent kingdoms like the Orkney Islands. The growth of the Pictish Kingdom was closely linked to its relations with neighbouring states, notably the Gaelic-speaking Dalriata, the Britonic Kingdom of Strathclyde, and the Anglian Kingdom of Northumbria. The balance of power among these kingdoms ebbed and flowed as they competed with each other for control of land, resources and trade routes. During the 7th century, a number of the Pictish provinces paid tribute to the Kingdom of Northumbria. This may have taken the form of cattle or perhaps grain. But in 685, the Pictish king Brithy, king of Fortree, challenged this state of affairs and a decisive Pictish victory at the Battle of Dunnachan changed everything. Historians are disagreed over the exact location of the Battle of Dunnachan, with some suggesting Dunnachan Hill near Forfar, quite close to here. Others, however, suggest Dunachton near King Yusi on Speyside as the more proper location. But whatever the exact location, many historians agree that this remarkable stone in Aberlemno Kirkyard commemorates the victory of Brithy over his cousin, the Northumbrian ruler Edgefrith. The carved figure on the stone here may in fact be Edgefrith being pecked by a raven. Anglian cavalry are depicted retreating from the scene with the Pictish army in hot pursuit. The Battle of Dunnachan not only ended Northumbrian control of Pictland, it also allowed the kings of Fortree to establish and consolidate their control over the other Pictish provinces. Over the next century, the Picts were united by Brithy's successors. 
Military campaigns by the ruthless king Onust in the middle of the 8th century were particularly important in extending for trees control over the other Pictish provinces. Pictish power and influence also extended beyond Pictland to include at times both Dalriata and the Kingdom of Strathclyde, while rivalry between Northumbria and Pictland resurfaced periodically. But while this side of the stone displays the military rivalry between Pictland and Northumbria, the other side shows some of the common values shared by both kingdoms. The emergence of a unified Pictish kingdom in the 8th century was greatly helped by the conversion of the Picts to Christianity. This is traditionally associated with the work of St Columba in the late 6th century, but it had in fact begun earlier with Pictish ministries and also carried on later into the 8th and 9th centuries. This side of the Aberlemnus stone clearly shows the common religious values shared by Northumbria and Pictland. The decorative techniques displayed on this cross were shared widely by Christian kingdoms uh, at this time. Art historians refer to this as insular fusion. Shared religious beliefs may have been a factor helping to promote periods of coexistence between Pictland and Northumbria. In 714, the Pictish king Nathan aligned the Pictish church with Rome's Easter calendar, which was observed in Northumbria, and ended the dating of Easter according to the Columban tradition on Iona. This seems to have encouraged a period of close cultural and religious contact between the two kingdoms. The high point of Pictish power is displayed in the regal Duplin Cross from the Royal Pictish Palace of Ferteviot, but housed now in St Serf's Kirk in Dunning. It's thought to be a memorial to Constantine, the Pictish king who ruled for 30 years. When he died in 820, the Pictish kingdom was probably at its greatest extent. Constantine's power was acknowledged among all the other Pictish provinces, his son Donal was ruler of Dalriata, and his authority extended as far as Orkney. This magnificent cross testifies to the power and majesty of a successful Pictish warrior king. Although the shape of the cross is not that of a traditional Pictish cross slab, some of the decoration and the depiction of the mounted warrior is characteristically Pictish. But the cross also has Northumbrian and Irish influences and a Latin inscription, Constantine Phileas Fircus, Constantine son of Fergus, Fergus being the Gallic form of the Pictish Urgist. The Duplin cross is a striking example of the way in which, at the height of their own power, the Picts had absorbed elements of other cultures and languages. The story of Pictish progress, symbolised by the Duplin Cross, was finally brought to an end at the end of the 9th century. The disappearance of the Picts from the historical record at the end of that century has been a source of considerable argument. What actually happened to the Kingdom of the Picts? The view among most modern historians is that Pictland was weakened by internal political conflicts and by Norse attacks, which included the Viking destruction of the Burghead Fort in 839 and other attacks in Strathern and Strathmore. Pictish forts, like here at Dunotter, were probably also destroyed during this period, although the ruins that we're looking at today are from a much later period. Weakened by the Viking onslaught, the Picts were unable to fight off an attack by Dalriata, which took advantage of the circumstances of the time to mount a takeover of Pictavia. The takeover of Pictland is traditionally associated with the ruler of Dalriata, Kenneth MacAlpine, in the 840s. But whereas traditional rivalries would have focused simply on his acquisition of the kingship, the times demanded something more extreme. In the years that followed, conquest gave way to colonisation. Historians are still divided on what this actually meant for the Picts. The traditional view suggested a genocide at the hands of the victorious Gaels, 
but most modern historians suggest that initial military defeat led to the Picts being gradually absorbed into this kingdom of Alaba, which succeeded both Pictavia and Dalriata during the 10th century. The Pictish language and many elements of Pictish culture, including the unique symbols on Pictish standing stones, disappeared as the Picts became part of the kingdom of Alaba's new people, the Scots. It's not clear how the Picts were integrated into the new Gaelic-speaking kingdom of Alba. Some early key events in the new kingdom included the establishment of new religious centres like Dunkeld and the creation of a royal power base here at Schoon. A new inauguration ceremony was established whereby kings were crowned sitting on the Stone of Destiny here at the Moot Hill. This marked the end of both the Dalriatan and the Pictish kingships and the establishment of a new kingship of Alaba. But if the Picts disappeared from the historical record as a separate people and a separate kingdom at this time, they didn't literally cease to exist. Some current DNA ancestral testing shows the presence of a genetic marker in the northeast and in central Scotland. It suggests that the Picts do indeed live on. They live on in the legacy of their symbol stones and also in their language. Although little of the Pictish language has survived and there are no surviving written texts, experts conclude that Pictish words reveal a Bretonic language closer to Welsh than Gaelic. Today, knowledge of this language is limited to the names in the king lists and some place names. Linguists have pointed out that the prefix Aber, which means at the mouth of the river, as in Aberdeen, is shared with Welsh. The Gaelic equivalent is Inyur or Inver, as in Inyur Nish, Inverness. Some Pictish place names, the so-called pet or pit names, are combined with a Gallic element. These place names help to locate historic Pictish settlements that were colonised in the Gallic takeover of the 9th and 10th centuries. Pit Capel in Aberdeenshire may combine the Pictish pit, meaning a part or portion of an estate, with the Gallic capel, meaning a mayor. Pitcapel becomes the settlement of the mares or horses. Pit Kennedy near Aberlemno may be the site of a Pictish settlement taken over by Gaelic-speaking Kennedys. There are several hundred pit names in Scotland. They provide a glimpse of a people and their past still visible after centuries of silence. In our films on the Picts, we've tried to summarise some of the recent thinking about them and provide a visual reference for some of their accomplishments. A current consensus sees the Picts as the indigenous people of the north and east of Scotland, who between the 5th and 9th centuries evolved from a number of small independent states into a single kingdom. They were united by their language, a form of Britonic, and by cultural and artistic achievements which have left a legacy of their unique symbol stones for posterity. By the end of the 7th century, the kings of Fortree had begun to dominate the other Pictish provinces and consciously attempt to create a, an inclusive Pictish identity to replace former allegiances. It's around this time that we first hear of the term Rex Picti or King of the Picts. The development of Pictavia was also helped by the conversion of the Picts to Christianity. This helped to unify the different parts of the kingdom under a common religion. For some Scots or those of Scots descent, connecting to the Picts may involve some search for Pictish genetic inheritance. But if you're searching for your inner Pict, you might just be missing the point. In the Picts, we can recognise the genius of a people who created and asserted their own cultural identity 
while also being shaped by the ideas and culture of others.